would sing a song of long ago when things could grow and days flowed quietly the air was clean and you could see and folks were nice to you would you like to come over for tea With the missus and me It's a real nice way to spend a day in Dayton, Ohio On a lazy Sunday afternoon In 1903 John Henry Patterson, a Dayton native, today is known as the father of American salesmanship. Even though we've had all kinds of famous inventors um, and engineers from Dayton, Patterson wouldn't count himself in that particular group. He was not an inventor of the cash register. Rather, he took the idea of the uh, incorruptible cashier, the idea of a mechanical device to track sales, and really shared it with the world and convinced the world, both the buying public and shop owners or merchants, of the need to actually have a cash register and to purchase cash registers. So an amazing, amazing figure. Um, many of the things that we take for granted today, whether we love them or hate them, are things that Patterson innovated. So for example, uh, the idea of direct mail advertising, what we might call junk mail, was a Patterson innovation. In those early days though too, Patterson came up with the concept of uh, get a receipt as a sales slogan. So nowadays we take that for granted that, oh, you know, you buy something, you, you want to get a receipt, you want to have your Amazon order stored on your computer. Well, again, uh, in this earlier period, he, he was really instrumental in convincing the buying public to only shop at stores where you could, in fact, get a receipt. John Henry Patterson was born on December 13, 1844, at the Rubicon Farm in Dayton, Ohio. His grandfather, Robert Patterson, was a Revolutionary War veteran and his father, Jefferson Patterson, served as a state representative. John would grow up working for his father on a massive 2,000-acre property. After deciding farming wasn't for him, Patterson attended college, graduating from both Dartmouth and Miami University. He also served in the Union Army during the Civil War, but didn't see any combat. He worked various jobs such as a toll collector on the Miami and Erie Canal. And it's while serving in that role that he starts to think about some of the practices that would serve him well in the future. So for some examples, he would uh, interact quite a bit with these uh, illiterate canal boat captains that had to track how much freight and cargo and, and bills of lading and bills of sale and how much money was going on and off of the, the ship. And so he actually starts using a series of color coding of uh, color coding of the paper, sort of like, you know, this is the, the blue paper, this one means this, and this red one means it. And, and really started to believe firmly, and there's some, absolutely some truth to his approach, that people learn best through the eye. He believed in teaching through the eye. So really for the remainder of his life, he was always coming up with ways to have what we might call visual aids or um, you know audiovisuals later on, but you know big visual aids to help put across a particular message. Patterson didn't stay on the canal forever. Eventually, he got into the coal business where he was again able to set himself apart. Sort of a lot of his competitors kind of had beaten up, dirty, dusty old wagons delivering coal to people. So he has really clean, wagons with bright lettering on them saying Patterson, you know, a, a coal company and, you know, really doing his best to, to have, an, have an impressive look to his company, what we might call like the Disney way. During this same period, so we're saying 1870s, now you're going into the 1880s, Patterson becomes familiar with a company called the National Manufacturing Company. And this was a company that had the rights to manufacture an invention by uh, Dayton brothers, the Riddy brothers, James Riddy in particular, had developed the incorruptible cashier, which is essentially a mechanical device to track sales. 
this company had taken a crude idea and developed it into the most widely used machine in the handling of money and records in the whole world. I've seen some of those early models since and heard some fantastic stories about them. When the first cash registers came out, some people were suspicious of them. They took the new machines to be a challenge to their honesty instead of a faster, more accurate way of keeping track of sales. Fortunately, this opposition didn't last long, but there just at first, some of the rougher element tried to run cash register men out of town. And in those days, it took a brave man to be an NCR salesman. To overcome the violent opposition to cash registers, Patterson pioneered the idea of sales training. After converting his sugar maple grove into a sales training camp called the University Under Canvas, or NCR Sugar Camp. Patterson laid the groundwork for what would become the standards for American salesmanship. You want to talk private? He'll do. Mr. Purdy, I'm from the National Cash Register Company of Dayton, Ohio. Uh -huh. Now, here is some new information about our new total adder. And uh, this is a three key sample model. But it wasn't just his salesman that Patterson was concerned with. He also pioneered worker welfare in a time when sweatshops were the norm and workplace safety was the last concern. He built the first ever daylight factory in the world, with each wall consisting over 80% glass. This flooded the factory with natural light and when things in the factory became too hot, the windows opened letting air flow through. He had company doctors and nurses and would have employees weigh in before their shifts. If they were underweight, they were served malted milk or soup. I mean, he wasn't just doing this because he had a heart of gold or something along that line. Sure. He was doing it because he knew that a happy and healthy workforce was a productive workforce. And a lot of this was driven from the fact that his company really was not much different than a lot of other companies at the time early on. Early on, it was dark. It was sort of dangerous working conditions. You know, he had an entire shipment of cash registers get sent back to his factory. And when that happened, he knew something was wrong and he knew he wanted to write the ship. And so what he does is he actually moves his desk to the factory floor to find out what the heck is going on. How can we fix this? And so he moves the desk there, very quickly sees like, well, you know, who wants to work in this kind of environment? Despite pioneering the concept of employee welfare, John Henry Patterson was a fierce boss. His executives were constantly under the threat of firing, and some would be fired multiple times for the simplest infractions. Charles Kettering was fired because he had trouble on a horse. Any man who can't handle a horse can't handle men, said Patterson. Being an executive at NCR during Patterson's time is considered by some to be an equivalent to an MBA. People like Edward Deeds, who would go on to establish Dayton Engineering Laboratories, or Delco with Kettering, as well as Thomas Watson Sr. of IBM. They called Patterson boss. Not only did he rule his company with an iron fist, but he waged war on his competitors. He'll do things like um, buy up some competing machines, basically have guys kind of alter the guts of the machines and put them out you know, for sale. And then of course they're faulty, they blow up. You know, people don't want them. So he does a lot of things that today we would look at and sort of think, oh, these are unethical or unscrupulous business practices. But, you know, certainly at the time, I think he saw them as all part of his mission to build a bigger and better company. Eventually, Patterson's antics would result in a 1912 conviction for him and many of his executives of violating Sherman antitrust laws. These charges would eventually be overturned by appeal when it was shown the prosecution withheld evidence beneficial to the defense. But before that could happen, tragedy struck Dayton in March of 1913. The Great Dayton Flood killed an estimated 400 people, displaced another 65,000, and triggered a gas explosion and fire, thus destroying 14,000 homes and buildings. All told, over $100 million in damages, more than $2 billion today. Patterson had seen flooding in Dayton before and recognized the danger. And he is literally in downtown Dayton, the Easter Monday, day after Easter, 1913, with the water, you know, all this rain is falling on what had been basically frozen ground, all kinds of runoff going to the rivers and streams. And so before any 
of the big alarms start going off around the community before the church bells start tolling and the factory whistles start blowing and everyone's heading for higher ground. Patterson sees what's about to happen, goes back to just south of town, um, up the fairgrounds hill, up over to his factory, and he immediately starts converting his factory into a uh, operation to be uh, one focused on uh, relief and recovery. So his woodworking department, he stops, you know, he stops their production of wooden cabinets for cash registers and immediately starts having them produce John boats that are going to be used to go out and rescue people. You know, he starts having his cafeterias and, and factory kitchens start producing large quantities of food for the people that he knows are going to be coming, seeking higher ground, seeking shelter. And so he, in fact, was right on the mark uh, because within hours, the levee breaks, sending a wall of water through downtown Dayton, 10 feet high, 12 feet high, 15 feet high in places, 20 feet high in some places. And it's not just the water, but the force of the water. It was a huge cataclysmic event for Dayton. It's the worst, it remains the worst natural disaster in uh, the community's history. And so John H. Patterson puts the full force of Dayton's largest company, National Cash Register Company, over to being a uh, rescue and relief operation. He literally sets up soup kitchens. He sets up a, a tent city on the grounds of NCR. In almost every way, I mean, he literally has people out with these NCR boats rescuing people from rooftops, rescuing them from, you know, utility lines where they're, you know, walking across and staying out of the water. After the floodwaters receded, Patterson's vice president, Edward Deeds, led the campaign to prevent this disaster from ever happening again. He raised over $2 million in private money from 20,000 donors. The slogan was, Remember the promise you made in the attic. He hired Arthur Morgan to construct a series of dams and levees that still protect Dayton and the Miami Valley to this day. Patterson and Deeds rescued Dayton from both the flood and future floods. But beyond that, John Henry Patterson revolutionized the world we live in. The next time you hear a cash register ring, remember the promises you made in your attic. Would you like to come over for tea With the missus and me It's a real nice way to spend a day in Dayton, Ohio On a lazy Sunday afternoon in 1900 